This is Unwind Your Mind Back to God, written by David Hofmeister and read by Tarana Singh. In today's chapter, we continue with the transfer of training with Book 3. In Chapter 3, this is Section 1, Part 2 of 6, Time, Space and Personhood, Part 2. The one thing that can truly be trusted is invisible in terms of the body. And that is the one thing the deceived mind is afraid of. As Jesus says in a number of places in the text, you are afraid of what your spiritual sight will show you. Text chapter 2 section 5 You believe that spiritual sight, that is, the Holy Spirit, will rob you of something or that you will lose something if you had spiritual sight. You are fearful that you would lose the world you see, which you would. (laughs) Friend, and as long as that seems like something, then it feels like loss. David, this makes trust impossible and you cannot believe that trust would settle every problem now. Thus do you think it is safer to remain a little careful and a little watchful of interests perceived as separate. From this perception you cannot conceive of gaining what forgiveness offers now. The interval you think lies in between the giving and the receiving of the gift seems to be one in which you sacrifice and suffer loss. You see eventual salvation, not immediate results. Text chapter 26, section 8 The mind is afraid of giving and receiving true forgiveness. That is where the loss seems to be. To give and receive the gift of forgiveness seems to entail loss. Friend, why? David, what seems to be lost in forgiveness is personhood. The little gap that makes one a separate, unique, individual person with personal interests, a personal past, a personal future and a personal will. The mind is terrified of losing its sense of a separate self. That is that little space, the little distance it would like to retain. Forgiveness just sees the false as false. Earlier, when there was all that anguish coming up, you said, It goes much deeper than just this talk about bodies moving around. It feels like I have to give up my whole world. From the ego's perspective, that is exactly how it looks. The ego is a sense of a separate self. With all its preferences and memories and all of its ambitions that seem to be private, that seem to be unique and separate, from everyone else. All that is part of this concept. Friend, it feels like the ego is just kicking in with everything it has. It's, it is seeing more and more clearly what is going on here and is pulling out all the stops. It feels so strong and powerful when that happens. David, we have certainly used the metaphor that the ego is pulling out all the stops, as if the ego is an entity with life of its own, as if it exists. But ultimately, it comes down to the idea that the ego is a decision and the Holy Spirit is a decision. Either you are an ego or you are not an ego. 
Can you see how that goes beyond the idea that the ego is kicking in? Describing it as if it really could kick in just seems to give it reality. Friend. So instead of describing it that way, it would probably be more helpful if I just say, I am deciding for the ego. David. Everything is a statement. Everything the mind thinks and says and does is teaching what it believes it is. You cannot leave it at that. That has to be a stepping stone or a metaphor. Where are you if you say, I am presently deciding for the ego? That is a definition of hell. Friend, again, who is that I, right? Is that what you're getting at? David, yes, it is a helpful stepping stone to say, I am not upset because of what happened yesterday or what happened 10 years ago or what I think will happen tomorrow. I am upset because it is a present decision. That is a definition of wrong-mindedness. A present decision for the ego is wrong-mindedness. And wrong-mindedness is the problem. All the sickness is wrong-mindedness, even though it does not seem that way. To the deceived mind, it seems like there are many problems and many forms of sickness that do not have anything to do with wrong-mindedness. But Jesus says that the decision for the ego for wrong-mindedness is sickness. Right-mindedness is the correction for wrong-mindedness. We are back to discernment between the right mind and the wrong mind. That discernment is the key. The key is really in coming to see that right-mindedness is the only possibility. You felt such glee earlier when you said, I am the right mind. We traced it and traced it back until you came to see that was the only possibility. I am the right mind. I am right-minded. That is the only possibility. Not I am right-minded some of the time, but I am right-minded, period. In that clarity, the wrong mind is dissolved. Another way of saying it is that the right mind must be a constant state because in reality there is no vacillation back and forth between right mind and wrong mind. That is just a metaphor. When the right mind is seen as a constant state, the wrong mind is no more. As we said earlier, these two thought systems are mutually exclusive. The immediacy of salvation section is about really coming to see that there is no gap between me and my brother because there is just one mind. There is no gap between private minds. Friend, I am deciding for the ego could be reworded as I am the right mind but right now I am denying it. I'm going to deny it in this instant. David, which you can see is meaningless when you really look at it. A body can say the words, I am the right mind. There is no doubt about that. A body can say the words, I am as God created me. The reason why we go so deeply into preferences, judgment and ordering of thoughts is because the right mind is a state where there is not any of that. No ordering of thoughts, no preferences and no judgments. Images are just seen as images. They are not arranged, they are not constructed and put together in a certain way. They are seen as impossible, as laughable. 
If ordering of thoughts seems to automatically bring about pain, guilt and fear, what is the point? Jesus says that those in heaven or of the real world, so to speak, have seen temptation but have seen the falsity of it. They see no value in judgment. Friend, and until I see that, I cannot stop judging. David, you could say it that way or you could say, I do not know who I am. You just said, until I see that. Here we are again with the immediacy of salvation. <laughs> Let's question that until. Salvation is immediate. Unless you so perceive it, you will be afraid of it, believing that the risk of loss is great between the time its purpose is made yours and its effects will come to you. In this form is the error still obscured that is the source of fear. Salvation would wipe out the space you see between you still and let you instantly become as one. And it is here you fear the loss would lie. Do not project this fear to time, for time is not the enemy that you perceive. Time is as neutral as the body is, except in terms of what you see it for. If you would keep a little space between you and your brother still, you then would want a little time in which forgiveness is withheld a little while. And this but makes the interval between the time in which forgiveness is withheld from you and given seem dangerous, with terror justified. Text Chapter 26, Section 7, Para 3. Section 8, Para 3. We pause here with the end of Part 2. We will continue with Part 3 of 6 of Section 1 of Chapter 3 of Book 3 of Unwind Your Mind in tomorrow's episode. <laughs>